Hello and welcome again to Why Fight, a conference on politics and ideology in militaries and armed groups organized by the UCD Center for War Studies. The papers in this session will examine the activities and motivations of paramilitaries. We often think of war as the business of standing armies, but a lot of armed conflict actually involves men and women who are not regular soldiers. This panel will examine the role of paramilitary groups in extending or limiting the reach of organized state power. Our next speaker is Carrie Ann Hansen, a doctoral candidate at the Stanley Barton Center for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide at Leicester University. Carrie Ann will examine the paramilitary legacies of Nazi violence and Auschwitz. Historians of Nazi Germany have long recognized prison camps as a key component of the Nazi toolkit of repression. More recently, the origins of Nazism in post-World War I paramilitary activity have gained increasing attention. Carrie Ann brings these perspectives together in her talk, considering Nazi practices of incarceration and the wider framework of European paramilitary history. Hi everyone, um, many thanks for coming to my talk and um, many thanks to Yanis for his tiresome efforts um, in taking the conference online. Uh, very well done. I'm sure we're all really thrilled that we can still um, we can still participate in what looks like an absolutely promising uh, conference on paramilitarism. Um, I am Carrie Ann Hansen. I am about to enter my second year of my doctoral studies at the University of Leicester. Previously, I studied at uh, Birkbeck College, University of London, and it is my research from there that I will be discussing today, which is the issue of violence in the bunker of Block 11 um, in Auschwitz. So I have studied Auschwitz for a few years now, and I often run into the same obstacles. Um, what do we do with the camps? They pose not just a challenge for the historian of the Holocaust, but also for the students of violence and its place in modern history more broadly. So I'm very excited about this opportunity to explore my research in the context of paramilitarism. Uh, Robert Jerworth and John Horn refers to the interwar years as the years when para paramilitary violence became subsumed into politics following the First World War. Moreover, perceptions of defeat, of continuity and revolution influenced how the violence developed and manifested itself. The rule of law or law and order could provide, they write, the space for transitional violence. Paramilitary violence, Joe Walton Horn writes, defined the years 1917 to 1923. One crucial factor for this post-war post violence was ideology of the class between communism, fascism and liberal democracy. If we then contrast this to what Victor, Victor Klemperer, a German professor of Roman and Romance languages, converted, also a converted Jew to Protestantism, which to some extent enabled him to survive during the Holocaust, he writes in his diary on March 10th, 1933, January 30th, Hitler Chancellor, now the business of 1918 is being exactly repeated, only, only under a different sign, under the swastika. Again, it's astounding how easily everything collapses. What by Klemperer be referring to? The business that Klemperer refers to is not just the end of the First World War, but presumably also the paramilitary violence that would engulf Germany for decades. Klemperer might be referring to the political, lapse of, the political collapse of the Weimar Republic, but above all, we must assume that he is also talking about taking stock of the violence in his reference to everything collapsing. The starting point is the German Revolution in 1818 and 1919, which, is, which has been studied by Mark Jones. In his excellent study, Jones integrates vi political violence into the field of imaginaries. By focusing on the corporal reality of violence, he discusses the intertwined factors of imaginaries and fantasies and self-beliefs, propelling the belief in conspiracies and radicalizing fear. In the end, this early violence, Jones argue, paved the way for the tolerance of violence, but also fueled this capacity for patterns of human behavior to essentially accept violence as a legitimate means to achieve goals and state action. I think these insights are key for understanding the development of the paramilitary phenomenon and its transformation uh, during the Nazi period. Daniel Siemens's work on the SA is a reminder of the role of the aftermath of the First World War and the problems of paramilitary violence in the Weimar Republic. Murders in Silesia and the Baltic, carried out by, by stormtroopers, including the future camp commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hess, um, took place in 1932 before the Nazi seizure of power in 1933. What happened was precisely what Jones argued. Extreme violence became politicized, which then undermined the Weimar Republic. 
I think Siemens's work demonstrates effectively the political side to interpretations of violence by stormtroopers by dehumanizing the victim, blaming the dead, and stylizing themselves as martyrs and heroes of the cause. Many of the stormtroopers that became active in the early 1930s had connections to the Freikorps, who had fought in, who had, for instance, fought uh, Poles in Upper Silesia, while many Germans voluntarily joined the SA, especially effective uh, recruitment um, was visible in the universities. And also in accordance to Chris Dillon's work, I think it's important to keep in mind the voluntarist principle uh, for understanding Nazi para paramilitary violence, the high level of conformity and demands of his members, first in the SS, SA and then later in the SS, seems to be key for understanding uh, the general de development of violence in Nazi Germany. So if we go into, if we go into the reality on the ground in the early 1930s, there is, a sh there is a shift from openly perpetrating violence on the street and the judicial and political decrees that would shape Nazi violence from below. Political decrees set in motion an enormous attack on alleged political opponents, often including racial elements as well, draped in the language of preemptive action by naming it protective custody, following the Reichstag fire, the ascendant dictatorship to draw on willing and ready SA stormtroopers, and indeed Hermann Göring even elevated them to auxiliary policemen. The incident set in motion in set in motion the Nazi machine of paranoia and massive preemptive action, leading to mass attainment of political political opponents. Uh, such as leading communists after March 1933, and thus the enemy, ba enemy base of those eligible for protective custody from the point of view of, of the Nazis uh, was soon extended to lower level um, social democrats and other politically active people. This was coordinated by the police, greatly aided by grassroots Nazi paramilitaries of the, of the SS and the SA. State terror in this early period then was coordinated between paramilitaries and the police. Where would these so-called enemies of the state taken? With the plurality of agencies involved, from the traditional police, the judiciary, the SS and the SA, these, wave of, uh, these waves of mass arrests under the guise of protective custody led to a need for places of confinement as, as the more traditional police prisons quickly filled up. Between 40 to 50,000 were arrested in March and April 1933. Many were kidnapped on the open street and brought to makeshift places such as deserted bars and other facilities. The ways into these places could, in, could include spells and bunkers and cells where they were beaten, tortured and threatened with suicide. Researchers identified in Berlin alone 170 makeshift places of violence and interrogation. There is no much excellent research on the early camps and the levels of violence and abuse perpetrated by SA and SS members. And you can find a good overview of this um, in Nick Waxman's um, Kayela History of the Nazi Concentration Camps. The, the point that I wish to make here is the transition, if you like, from open-ended public violence to a removal of the violence from this public sphere by using so-called places of solitary confinement. The lasting impact of this early violence in the Third Reich came to mark the concentration camp system, which evolved from 1934 onwards. By 1934, the open-ended violent revolution was scaled down, but Himmler was not finished with the camps as illustration of its accumulation of power within the police. This went again the judiciary, who continued to underline the rule of law in their maintaining control of so-called lawbreakers, which the SS sought to circumvent. Himmler's Nazified police force was beyond the law. The establishment of the inspectorate to concentration camps in, in early December 1934 meant that the administration of the camps were left to Theodor Eike, a long standing member of the SS and the first commandant of Dachau, and also the first inspector of the camps, signaling the way forward for Himmler's camps. Improvisation was to be replaced by systematization and centralization through the administrative divide between SS sentries, those guarding the camps, to those higher ranking administrative functions. ICA's punishment catalogue comprised the stipulated punishment for prisoners in addition to service regulations for the SS, SS sentries, allowing the use of firearms towards uh, prisoners, fueling a bureaucracy of terror, which, as, argues, as argued by Nick Waxman, uh, was not designed to prison into violence, but to streamline it. At the centre of this, of this stood the punishment catalogue, specifying different stages of solitary confinement. Another example of the intertwined institutions of the penal system and paramilitary violence in the Third Reich. I do not have the time to go into much uh, detail, um, but the point uh, I want to make is that the punishment catalogue officially solidified 
um, the space of the bunker in the camps. If we follow Chris Dillon's contention that the SS always attempted to cast itself as an official, respectable and decent organization, uh, distancing itself from the SA, um, this in turn led to a strict regime of socializing into violence, you can also see the work by Karin Ocht on this, and the inner discipline expected of the SS men. This did not mean to stop short of performing violence, it's just meant that it was instrumentalized and was supposed to be consensus driven uh, within the acceptable uh, boundaries set, uh, set by ideology and the center of authority, um, Heinrich Himmler. Um, I think that this is important in keeping in mind in, in discussing violence in the camps, the conception of the political soldier and the decency in murder. Um, especially important for keeping in mind is as Chris Dillon contains, violence pervaded every sphere, sphere of life for these men and became a reflex response to any kind of social challenge. This is important to keep in mind as the concentration camps are usually associated with order, bureaucracy, routine violence and degradation. While all of this is true, this view is rather static and leaves out important social and cultural factors of the violence. If we fast forward some seven years then to Auschwitz in 1940, what effect had the standardization of violence in the camps? Roughness, toughness, sorry, masculinity and socialization into violence for the so-called Camp SS, a term developed by Karin Ort to denote the key players that drove the camp system forward. Uh, I will focus on these key players in Auschwitz without reducing them to biographical sketches, uh, of course, the thrust of my argument is rather that there are broader intersections of violence at play here as members of all administrative sections in Auschwitz was operative in the bunker. This ranged from the camp commandant to the agencies um, responsible for punishments, roll call and interrogation. The camp prison in Auschwitz was known as the Kommandantura Rest, uh, it's also where the bunker that I'm referring to was located in the basement and it ha and housed, I think it was up to 21 to 23 cells, just depending on how you count them, um, throughout the camp's history, um, but especially from 1942 onwards, um, these cells were used to inflict extreme um, violence. Um, it was also at this point in 1942 where the so-called quite infamous standing cells were constructed, which was aimed at inflicting extreme psychological pain uh, and deprivation. Of course, the use of the bunker was extensive and I cannot cover all of its functions here, but suffice it to say that the bunker was used to punish prisoners in accordance to the rules. Um, this in, this um, this meant uh, starving them to death, um, subjecting them to extreme uh, methods of interrogation, and, but also as a holding space while awaiting decision making. Now, the point I want to make is that there are similar, similar practices in the bunker in Auschwitz to that of the paramilitary violence of the early 1930s. The threat of suicide, for instance, and forcing selected prisoners to commit suicide, which is very visible in the documents that I've been working with. Rumors had it, one prisoner ended up eating his own shoe. Another one was forced to eat salted herrings after interrogation, and, and on at least two occasions, whole blocks of prisoners were selected for starvation in the so-called dark cells as reprisals for escaped prisoners. Um, food deprivation especially was a common psychological weapon of, of the SS in Auschwitz. Both in the courtyard and in the loft of Block 11, prisoners were tied to a pole and hanged with their hands on their back. The extreme psychological violence inflicted in the bunker is something I explored in a chapter called The Everyday Life. Um, I found in general that the level of SS presence was low. The bunker was staffed by prisoners, mirroring, mirroring the general organization uh, of the camp where the SS were forced to as the camps grew in scope and in demographics, uh, tended to draw in more and more prisoners in the administrative running. Um, additionally, I found it curious as to why the camp SS essentially needed a prison within the camp, but of course it connected to the means of separating prisoners from the prisoner, po prisoner population as a whole, to acting on dubious pretexts that warranted a demonstration of SS power, but it also reflected the reality of the situation in and around the Auschwitz camp. One of the most important findings from my thesis was that it appears that the camp administrations focused more on draconian reprisals, as opposed to demonstrative public forms of domination, such as hanging. This is a despite ritualistic and public displays of capital punishment by hanging uh, emerged as an SS response in the camp system from 1942 onwards. But as a whole, I find that the Auschwitz camp SS did not go for this option. 
Instead, they use other means such as gassing, confinement to the bunker, and other forms of murder. This might be because the SS risk loosing some control by staging public displays of power and thus opening up for public displays of prisoners' defiance, which did happen on multiple occasions in Auschwitz, uh, starting in July 1943. In this way, the SS tried to, try to construct a spectacle for prisoners and for all the prisoner society to witness, a practice tradi traditionally viewed as dishonorable. On the other hand, the incident reveals what Elisa Mailanda Kosla refers to as the SS's inability con to control the perception on behalf of prisoner society. So this is interesting. Was this a calculated strategy of the SS to not stage public hangings? Did their view of their inability to control the population, uh, control the prisoner population diminish so swiftly? Or could it also be that they simply preferred other forms of uh, violence and killing? It's likely that the communication from the center and from Himmler influenced the Camp SS, who, perceive, who received reprimands and warnings as early as 1941 of curbing all the escapes from the camps. Thus, escape signal an important negative failure on behalf of the Camp SS, linking the center and, and Himmler to the camp proper by bureaucratic routines, as Himmler was in theory the only one to sanction capital punishment in the camps. Nevertheless, the Camp SS did not shy away from murder, and an important thing to keep in mind is that executions by firearms had been taking place in the camps since 1940 by means of directors of the center and RSHA, the Reich uh, Security my Main Office. Bringing in civilians to, the killing, to be killed in gravel pits in the immediate vicinity of the camp was happening as early as 1940, and this was also the way of killing selected uh, Soviet prisoners of war. So it could be that given Given the Auschwitz camp SS now appointed its own firing score to carry out these executions, perhaps sought fit to take matters into their own hands. And not least to engage in violence that might be viewed as more functional or even more honorable or just. In fall 1941, the camp SS set up a wall in a courtyard between block 10 and 11, and which was known as the wall of death, which between 1941 and fall 1943 was used at the main site of executions. This was also the designated place for staging capital punishment in the camp. The routine connected to this way of killing aimed at dehumanizing, pacifying, and humiliating those selected for death. They were almost, almost led through the bunker, often having spent weeks or months there, stripped naked in the washroom where some murders were carried out too, and then to the courtyard marked with numbers for easy identification later surrounded by SS men and the firing squad. This was in many ways one of the few spaces that the SS was in complete control. They had control of the audience of the spectacle. It should also be noted that this did not create a distance because the victims were shot in the neck at close range, often by the non-commissioned non report leader, Gerard Powich, who became a seasoned executioner in the camp. The killing is very intimate as Powich, and I quote, would hold a rifle a few centimeters from the prisoners' necks. This was an intimate form of killing, killing at least 1,000 prisoners who were registered in the bunker for various reasons. The majority being killed between January 1943 and August 1943. 4,500 were killed so due to summary court convictions, which then worked independently of the, of the Auschwitz camp administration. This way of killing was swift compared to hanging. It allowed the SS full control of the corpse and the spectacle itself. It was swift too and required minimal manpower. If we look back at the regulations, SS were allowed to shoot prisoners if they were attacking or disobeying orders. It could perhaps also be that the use of firearms, which connects to paramilitary practices, um, where firearms in the SS too was a matter of military training and thus capacity for violence. Many SS received firearms training where all layers of camp staff carry different types of firearms in the camps. I am not able to verify whether this was the case in Auschwitz. Um, as, uh, but as Christopher Dillon writes, carrying firearms was an assertion of status. These killings were viewed different from the SS becomes plausible when looking at Nick Waxman's work, who argues that the camp SS preferred gas for bigger operations of mass murder. In this way, perhaps killing by firearms underlined the extrajudicial uh, character of the killings, a long-standing tradition in the military, and creating the image of soldiering and producing masculinity, as argued by Elisa Mailanda Koslov, as opposed to ideological mass murder by gas, which is not to suggest uh, that any of the SS men in Irish opposed the gassings in, in principle, but this is a different topic. Uh, 
there is, of course, much more to be said, uh, but for now, I hope to have provided some background as to why we might start to consider or reconsider some new context for understanding, understanding the different modes of killing in Auschwitz, and not least to demonstrate that the camps were not closed off universes, but institutions that were defined by the longstanding tradition of paramilitary violence, which it seems to be were reshaped in the camps and embodied the extrajudicial character of Nazi Germany. Here, the SS stylizing themselves as fighting soldiers, indulging in deadly military fantasies far away from the military battlefield of war. In the end, they always remained close to murder. Thank you.